I want to uh, just say hello again to everyone online. Uh, last Sunday, I got to meet a couple, three guys actually. One was from Kenya, and then two were from Jamaica. And so uh, we were out in the foyer praying, and uh, they were heading back to their countries, and uh, they wanted to watch online. So they might be watching online uh, this morning, and so I want to shout out to those guys. We were figuring out the time in Kenya it would be 7 p.m., I believe, and in Jamaica, it's gonna be 9 a.m. So uh, I was excited about that in our digital ministry. So if you guys are watching, we're so glad that you're with us. Our new friends from Kenya and Jamaica, right? Let's put our hands together for them, everyone else online. It's cool. I was, <laughs> you know, uh, we're talking about unshakable faith. And, you know, God, God wants us to grow our faith, God wants us to grow our belief in him. Our faith and our belief in him are very important to God. Does that make sense to you? So when we first come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, for me it was middle school, that's when I first placed my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Uh, that was the birthday of my new faith in Jesus. But, but since then, God has wanted my faith to grow, my belief in him to grow and that's what he wants for all of us, for all of us to grow in our faith and our belief to the point where it's almost unshakable. I know there are things that happen in life that can shake us, but, but our belief in faith is very important. That's why we're talking about that this month. L last week, we talked about adversity and how Jesus will bring adversity into our life uh, at, at different times. So he'll use that to grow our faith. Remember Lazarus and Mary and Martha and how he orchestrated that whole thing. Why did he do it? So other people could believe, so they could have faith. And we talked about how that could be a new theological category for you, that God would actually bring adversity into your life to grow uh, your faith. But he will do that. And I've just learned to see adversity as something that's coming from God. And so that's helped me out a lot. Uh, God, you brought it into my life. You have a purpose for it to grow something in me, my faith and belief. And so I accept it. And so I've been able to grow in that way. And I hope that uh, you are able to as well uh, over the course of your life. And so, it looks like the guys got it fixed. Thanks, guys. Good job. You got it fixed. Uh, small group leadership training is going to be happening this Thursday night at 6 p.m. This is for current leaders and people that are considering leading a small group. So that is for you. Excited about 6 p.m. August 17th here at the church. And then Baptism Sunday, August 27th. Again, if you haven't gone public with your faith, this is the next opportunity. There's a Connect card in your seat. Fill it out. Place it in one of the give boxes as you leave, and we will reach out uh, to, to you. So I know this statement's going to blow you away. This is crazy, crazy statement. Private disciplines are disciplines you do in private. This, yeah, wow. Everyone gets it, right? So I, I couldn't come up with anything better. I searched, struggled to come up with something better than that, but that's what you got from me today. Private disciplines are disciplines you do in private. Now, I'm talking about disciplines, especially giving and prayer. Disciplines now doesn't create warm fuzzies in your soul when we talk about discipline. I know when I was growing up, uh, discipline had a very negative connotation. Discipline was something that happened when I did something bad. I wished, I was singing this week, I wish I would have grown up in a generation where you got a time out for being bad. You know, <laughs> like, come on, Dan, you shot your sister in the eye with a dart gun. Let's have a timeout. Well, thank you, Mom. I would love to go play some video games and have a timeout. It's not what happened. We got a little discipline. So, hey, things change, right? Things change. So discipline, I know, that's not a great word. That's not something that, you know, most, most of us love. I was listening to Nick Saban. Most of you know I love football, and so I'm always listening to coaches. He was talking about discipline with his football team. He said, listen, guys, if we're going to have a great season. We have to be disciplined. You have to do your job. You have to be disciplined all season. Every, every coach will say this, and it's very important because you have to have discipline to win football games. And he said discipline was this, uh, doing what you don't feel like doing and not doing what you feel like doing. And that's how he defined discipline. I thought that was really good, doing what you don't feel like doing and then not doing what you feel like doing. Uh, he compared it to a stop sign uh, down the street from the athletic complex. You know, guys, you come down to that stop sign, and you know you should stop and look both ways, right? You know you should do that. But all of us, we got some places to go, so some of us kind of roll through the stop sign, right? Now, if there's a police officer sitting at that intersection, are you going to roll through the stop sign? 
No, because the police officer's there. But when you're in private, when no one's watching, it's a lot easier to roll through the stop sign. So we were golfing yesterday, and the rule was that you had to stay on the cart path. If you've never golfed, when there's a lot of rain and the course gets soggy, you don't want to take a cart across the fairways because it can damage the golf course. And so the rule was, we've got a lot of rain, you have to keep your cart on the golf, uh, golf path. So I did good. You were so proud of your pastor. I did good for eight holes. <laughs> then on the ninth hole, I tee off and I hit a shot to the other fairway. Have any of you ever done that? You hit, you're not in your own fairway, you're in the other fairway. And so I thought, that is a long walk to that ball. So what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna go across the fairway, not in the main part, it was in an, a part kinda by this little lake. I'm gonna go scoot over here and then go up that cart path to get my ball. And Andy, she's in the cart with me, and, and, and Andy said, my wife, she said, Dan, this is not the place to do this. I said, don't worry, honey. I've been good for eight holes. I can do it this one time. So I go over, I get across, I start heading up this cart path. Then I see another cart coming down the cart path towards me. They were playing the other hole. I don't want to get in their way, so I shouldn't have done this. So I turned and went back across the fairway, back to where I should have been. I get over to my cart path, and what do you know? Here I see a cart coming. It's like the golf police coming down the cart path. It was, this, it was the owner of the golf course. And I can see the look on his face, and it's not good. And so he's approaching me, and he said, Sir, keep the golf cart on the golf path. I said, Yes, sir, I will. So I get in the parking lot, and there's Chris King. Chris King goes to our church, uh, Chris and Michelle, and he happened to be running a golf event. I didn't know he was going to be there. He was running the golf event that happened before, and I was telling him this story. And he said, Dan, there's a lesson to be learned in that story, that you can do things correctly. You can do the right thing in private nine times out of ten. But it's that one time that you mess up where you need the grace of God. I said, I want you to go talk to the owner of the golf course and tell him about the grace of God because he didn't show me grace in that. <laughs> but, but isn't that so true? So listen, this message, please don't check out. Please don't say, oh, I don't want to listen to this because he's talking about discipline. I, I get, this isn't about shaming you or making you feel bad because the grace of God is needed. Listen, none of us hit these private disciplines all the time, okay? So are you with me here? I, I just want you to, even your pastor yesterday didn't get it all right, need the grace, grace of God. And so Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, uh, he, he's, Matthew was a tax collector. He was, he was rigid. He was, he, I think he was the kind of a rule guy, do's and don'ts. I mean, he had to be to be a tax collector. He's transformed radically by Jesus. And he tells us about a time in Matthew chapter 6 of his gospel where, where Jesus is talking about a couple private disciplines, giving and prayer. And, and so he, he starts off with, with what Jesus said here. Jesus said, watch out. And I had, to, I had to kind of chuckle because if Jesus, if the Son of God says watch out, probably ought to pay attention, right? Probably ought to pay attention to what he's going to say next. Jesus, the Son of God, says watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. Now, I get that this may be offensive to some of us this morning because that word reward and you may say, I don't give to get a reward. I don't pray to get a reward. And, and I, that may offend you. I understand that, that you don't do it for reward. I am just telling you what Jesus said. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. So don't get mad at me about the whole reward thing. I'm just trying to show you what Jesus says. He says, when you give to someone in need, and he's talking about giving here, giving money, don't do as the hypocrites do, Blowing trumpets, and he names the two places that the Jewish people would give. Blowing trumpets in the synagogue. So the synagogue was the church where people came to corporately worship like we are doing today. So that's number one, blowing trumpets in the synagogues. And the streets, out in the streets, out in public, people would give. If a Jewish person was going to the synagogue, oftentimes they would maybe see a beggar, someone poor in need, and they would give something to that person. He says, don't do this as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention 
to their acts of charity. And some of you have heard the word almsgiving. When I was preparing for this message, I came across the word almsgiving. That's what it was called back then. Jewish people, it was almsgiving. And I was confused by this word. What is an alm? And it goes back to the Greek and Latin origins. It actually means to have pity on someone, to have charity uh, towards someone, to have mercy on someone. I was originally thinking alms, are we talking about oatmeal here? Is this oats? Is alm? I don't know. That's kind of the thought I had. We giving away oatmeal? No. It is charity, mercy, grace that Jesus is talking about here. And Jesus says, listen, when you do this, don't make a big deal about it. So, you know, I love the opportunities that we have to give today. If you've been around our church for very long, you know, we don't really pass the buckets. We don't make a, make a big to-do um, about giving. We just ask you to ask God about generosity and obey Jesus and figure it'll work out. So we have, you know, giving stations as you leave here today, and there's giving envelopes that you can give and place those. And we have online, and a lot of people, you know, go online. So there's lots of ways to do this privately. But I guess what Jesus is saying is if you give online or you give back there, you know, don't make a big to-do and blow the trumpet and tell everyone that you're giving. And if you give someone out in the streets, don't, don't make a, a big deal about it. Just don't make a show of it, Jesus would say. He says, I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. So if they do that and they get applauded, that's the reward that they are going to get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand, so here's your left hand, know what your right hand is doing. So if your left hand is going to give, it kind of like hides itself behind its back. And the right hand's like, what are you doing, left hand? And the left hand is like, I'm not telling you what I'm doing. But the right hand's wanting to know, what are you doing? No, I'm not gonna tell you. So that's kind of how it's supposed to be. So I'm glad you found that humorous, Becky. I thought that was humorous too. I laughed out loud when I was thinking about doing that. So this is, that's what Jesus is, is saying. He says, give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will rewards you. And so Jesus is teaching about this private disciplining, and he's saying that, that, that God is he's watching all of this. And so here's my question. For everyone watching online, everyone in the room, what if you really believe this? What if you really believed this? What if you really had faith in what Jesus is saying? How would you handle giving? So I know this is not a cheery thought, but all of us, our life will come to an end. All of us are going to die. And so I've thought this week about, I don't know when the day I will die is, but whatever day I am going to die, when my life is over here, all of my belief, all of my faith, I don't have options at that point, okay? All of my belief, all of my faith is in the personal God that I believe in. I I believe in the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a personal God that desires to have a personal relationship with me. But I also realize I'm talking to some people maybe here in the room or maybe online that don't believe the way I do. That you believe in a different God. You believe in a different higher power. So I get that, I understand that. But even if that's you, right? If that's you, you believe in a different God, When you die, you don't have many options, right? Whatever God you're believing in, at that point, all the cards are on the table. You you have no, it's completely dependent, right? And so, if we believe that logically, if we if we know that, and, and we realize that time is coming, and we come back to this moment right now, and we have this time between this moment right now and whatever time that's going to be, in that time, what if we really believed when it came to giving that our Heavenly Father is watching how we handle our money and that when that time does come, He is going to reward us according to what we've done in the time we have from now until that day? Now, listen, I get when it comes to giving money, people get emotional. I mean, really, people burr up. I don't think I've ever preached the message on giving to God when people didn't 
either send me an email or say something to me after the message or, or have some kind of, I, it just stirs up emotions. I don't know why it stirs up so emotions because it's just pieces of paper with dead presidents on them. I mean, that's what it is. And then Benjamin Franklin, right? I mean, that's it. Or is it Edison or Franklin? Franklin, yeah, I mean, that's it. So why do we get so emotional over this? It's because money represents security. It's because money represents safety to us. The more money that we have, the more secure we are, the safer we are, right? And that's why Jesus, if you read further on in the chapter here, Jesus gets to the point where he says, listen, you can't serve two masters. You can't have your faith and trust in money and also have your faith and trust in God. And so if this is a faith issue, if this is a belief issue, then why wouldn't Jesus mess with the thing that gets us real emotional to grow our faith and belief. From this moment now to whatever that time is, why wouldn't Jesus mess with our pocketbook in that time frame? Why wouldn't he do that? To test our faith, to test our belief. And if we really believe what he says is true. And then Jesus moves on. Aren't you glad? I'm glad Jesus moves on. Okay. He moves on to prayer. And when you pray, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues. He names the two same places where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you. And we've talked about this before. And pray to your Father in private. This private discipline. Then, Jesus says, your Father, your personal Father, Abba Father, who sees everything, even though no one else can see you praying, even though no one else can see it, your Father sees it. And Jesus says, he will reward you. I don't pray for reward, Pastor Dan. I get it. I get it. I know you don't. I know you don't pray for reward. I'm just trying to tell you what Jesus says. That your heavenly father, he is so good, he is so loving, he wants to reward you. He wants to bless you. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, if it's right now or if it's later on. But he wants to reward you. So again, the same question, what if you really believed this? What if you really believed that going in a room and shutting the door and, and offering your prayers to God would make a difference and that your father would see it and that he would reward you from this time now to whenever that time is, what would you do with your time? Because Jesus is talking about our two most precious resources, our money and our time. This is what Jesus is getting at. We have money and we have time. Time is a, really a more precious resource than money, right? We can't buy a day. There's not enough money to buy another day, right? But he's talking about these resources we have, money and time. God, I don't have, I, I don't have enough time to pray. I'm too busy to pray. I, is this, are we? But Jesus would say, come on, take a moment, go someplace, shut the door, and just call upon me. And when you do that, oh, we're going to get so close. We're going to get so close, and I'm going to show you things that, that you've never seen before. See, 21 days of prayer, the secret to 21 days of prayer, it's in the 21 days. It's, it's in that discipline. It's in that discipline of, of just saying, you know, I may not feel like doing this, but I know this is a way that you will grow my faith, God, and so I'm gonna do what I don't feel like doing because I know that you will grow my faith through this. Same thing with giving. There's a time in my life where I didn't wanna give anything to God. I wanted to keep it all. But if you talk to any follower of Jesus, at some point they will tell you a story how God grew their faith and grew their belief through money and through prayer. There's going to be a story about giving and about prayer. There's going to be a story if you talk to any believer 
that's mature in Christ, that has grown up in Jesus Christ, there is going to be a time when Jesus messes with your pocketbook and Jesus messes with your time and you come out on the other side and you're like, wow, I wish I would have had these private disciplines way earlier in my life. Amen? Amen. If you've experienced that, amen. Can you just say amen? Like, it's true. So, so this isn't really like a bad thing to shy away from. This is an invitation. An invitation to give to God and to pray to God. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up with this story, just a story of how prayer makes a difference. So uh, really for the last eight years since I became your lead pastor, I've engaged in this uh, prayer life and this prayer journey, and I've grown so much because I knew I needed prayer to lead you. And, and so two years ago, two years ago, uh, I was doing a, a funeral for uh, Teresa uh, Lagumbo. And uh, we were, she had passed away, and she was young, and we were over in the gym, and we were having lunch, and, and our, uh, our team was providing lunch. They're, they're beautiful people that provide lunch for people when they lose loved ones. And so I'm over there, and I interact with family members, and I'd never met this guy. I didn't even know who he was, but there was this table, and he was the life of the party. This guy was telling jokes, and he was loud, and he was boisterous. He kind of reminded me of what I think the Apostle Peter would be like, just this kind of loud, you know, talk first and regret it later kind of a guy. And so he's just the life of the party. And I felt a nudge of the Holy Spirit to go engage this young man. And so I go over to the table and I start engaging him and talking to him. And, and uh, I said, hey, uh, found out his name was Travis and said, hey, Travis, you know, we're about to eat. And I think it would be really good if you say the prayer for our meal. And his eyes got about this big. And uh, he's like, really, me? Say the prayer? And I said, yeah. I, I said, I think, I think you, it would be great that you could say the prayer. You're charismatic. I mean, you just have a lot of passion. You, you could just pray for this meal. And then he thought for a second. And I didn't think he was going to say yes. There was no way I thought he was going to say yes. And so he said, sure, I'll pray. And then my eyes got about that big because I didn't know what this dude was going to pray because I heard some of the things he was saying at the table. Just let me leave it there. And so he gets up and he prays for this meal. And it's a beautiful prayer. It kind of blew me away. I'm like, this guy has something about him. I think God wants to use this guy for ministry. And so I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit again. Go get your business card, write your cell phone on it, and give it to him and tell him, when you're ready to do God's work, call me. So I went and got my business card, wrote my cell phone, went back into that room and said, hey, Travis, when you're ready to do God's work, you call me. He took the card and put it in his wallet. This was two years ago. Last Sunday, I went home after church, had dinner with my in-laws, and my phone rang during dinner, and I didn't answer it because we we're having dinner. And so there's a voicemail left on it. So I go over and listen to the voicemail, and it's Travis. Travis is on my voicemail from two years ago. And the voicemail starts out like this. Pastor Dan, I don't even know if you remember me, but when you were at Teresa Legambo's funeral and at the lunch and you met me there and, and you asked me to pray and you, as, I mean, I remembered it precisely, like 4K, high definition, I remember this. And so, I, and he said, you gave me the card and, and, and he, he said a couple other things and I could tell his voice was, was shaky, he was emotional. And at the end of his message, he said, it's time. Give me a call, pastor. It's time. My jaw dropped. This was two years ago. My jaw dropped. Oh, the guy, I'm like, are you, is this real? Are you kidding me? And so um, I, get a hold of, I get a hold of Travis this week, and he talked to me for about 45 minutes about what Jesus is doing in his life. He said, Pastor Dan, I, I met this girl online, and we were dating for five, six months, and she had this dog, and the dog was with me every day, and I loved her dog, and I loved her. And then one day, she told me that she found someone else online and that she was gonna leave me, and the dog was gonna go, and I know this sounds crazy, Pastor Dan, but I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken, and God took her away from me and took this dog away from me, and I cried for two months every single day. He said, during this time of, of breaking, I acknowledged, and I was never mad at God. I'm proud of myself for that, Pastor. I was never mad at God, but I knew God took her away and this dog away because I had not surrendered my life to Jesus. 
And he said, my sin debt was so great. My sin debt was so great. And I began to see my sin debt. And I began to realize that Jesus died for my sin debt. And his blood on that cross, it took away all my sin debt. And he said, now I'm praying. And I, and I don't even like how, I just pray all day. And I'm a nurse and I'm at hospitals. And I'm going into people's rooms now. And, 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 and I can see and I'm praying for them and telling them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is just working through my life. He said, Pastor Dan, it's just amazing what God is doing in my life. And he said, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you about last Sunday when I called you. God had told me to give you a call about two weeks ago. But I, I, I didn't know where your card was. And so I, I knew I hadn't thrown it away, but I wasn't quite sure where it was. And I remember that on my lattice in my apartment, there's a picture of my mother, and, and my mother died when I was three years old. And so I, I haven't had her my whole life, but I have this picture of my mother in this lattice in my apartment. And, 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 and God brought to mind that I'd put your card behind the picture of my mother. And so I went to that picture, pulled it out, and there was your card. But I didn't call you. And God said, call him, but I didn't call you. And so God kept talking to me, and, and, and for two weeks he was nudging me, saying, call Pastor Dan, call Pastor Dan. And I, w and I wasn't, I was kept saying no. <laughs> and he goes, so that Sunday, last Sunday, he goes, I was in, I was in my apartment. I, I didn't go to church that morning, and I've been going to this one church a little bit, but I didn't go to, go to church, and so I just stayed at home, and I watched Joel Olstein, and he's funny, and he's positive. I watched him. So. And, uh, and then after that was over, I went out to my living room, and my house, my apartment is clean. I, I'm a bachelor, but it's clean. It's spotless. And he goes, I was going to sit down in my recliner. I was sitting down in my recliner, and I, next to my recliner of this table, and I was, gonna, I was sitting my phone down on, onto this table. And when I looked down at where I was going to set my phone, there were five maggots on that table. And he said, my apartment's clean. I started looking underneath the table. I started looking around for, like, other maggots or flies, or did I have some food? Or, I mean, was there food on the table? Or was, he goes, it was spotless. It was clean. But there were five maggots there. And he said, when I put my, when I was about to put my phone, God told me that if you don't call Pastor Dan, those maggots are a picture of what your life is going to be like. You are going to return back to the sin that you were in. Call Pastor Dan now. And he goes, that's when I called you. And that's why my voice was shaking. And that's why I said, it's time. And so I'm like, Travis, this is like New Testament stuff. This is Old Testament stuff. This is miraculous stuff. This is supernatural stuff. And some of you made me listening. Some of you made me in the room like, that, that can't be true. This is true. Like, God is still a God of miracles. God is still a God of power. And if he wants to put five maggots on a table to tell someone to make a phone call, he'll do it. See, some of us, we don't believe God moves like he did anymore. It's the same God, everybody. God still does miraculous things. And so I said, well, Travis... And you're literally, in my phone, you are Travis Apostle Peter. And I said, I think you need to read 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He said, Peter has books in the Bible? I said, yeah, he's got two. Actually, I said he has three, but then that was John. I said, he, actually, he only has two. But I want you to read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, because this is who you are. And then the next thing is this. We are having a baptism service on August 27th. And I feel like God is telling me that you need to come down here and go public with your faith and be baptized. So if you want to meet Travis, come here on August the 27th because Travis said, I'm coming down. I'm going to be baptized. I'm going public with my faith. In fact, there's a big event happening on the 28th where my life is changing. I'm going into a new job, and I would love to be baptized on the 27th, the day before I go into this new journey. So, all that to say, when you pray, you may not see answers to your prayers. 
in this lifetime or for years or months, I don't know. Like Andy said, it may be like it's going into a black hole. But if you go in the room and shut the door on a regular basis, you'll get so close to God and he'll show you things and he'll nudge you to do things that you think are crazy and that make no sense. But he will reward you because he's a loving heavenly father and there's no better life than to live a life surrendered and consecrated to Jesus Christ. So what's the next step? I stole this from Nike, by the way, if you're wondering. Even the swoosh, that's from, I stole all of this. Stole, 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 just do it. So, (laughs) So what's the next step? Just do it. Just give, just pray. Don't make a big show about it. Don't make a big deal about it. Just try it. Do you know where Nike got this from? Nike got this from an inmate that was on death row. There was an inmate that was on death row, was gonna be executed, and these were his final words. He said, let's do it. It's a true story. That's what this guy said, let's do it. So the marketer for Nike was reading this, and he said, he kind of laughed jokingly, I would have had to give him credit if I would have kept, let's do it. So I changed it to, just do it. Because he said, if a guy on death row had that kind of courage, like had that kind of, let's do it. Like I wanted our, our corporation, our business to have that kind of mindset, like okay, whatever, whatever we're facing, whatever we don't feel like doing that we need to do or whatever we need to do that we don't feel like doing, we're gonna put on some Nikes, we're gonna put on a Nike shirt and, some, and we're gonna just do it. You know, if it applies to sports, can it apply to our faith? Right? I mean, can't we just do it? Sure we can. So, 21 days of prayer. We're podcasting live over there at 6.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday. It's just 15 minutes. Just get your day started off. Saturday at 9 a.m. You can jump in anytime. It's on YouTube, Facebook, on our Camp Nazarene Connect app. It'll take some time to upload all the episodes. I'm not too worried about that, the... One on the app is there. You can just, it's there until the next one shows up. So you can jump in anytime you want. But I'd encourage you. I'd encourage you to not see these private disciplines as something that's, oh, you know. It's an invitation. It's, it's an invitation to grow our faith, to grow our belief, so that it can be unshakable. And the good one about this, the good thing about this one is like we have a choice about this. We can actually do this. I'm gonna invite you to stand. I'm gonna say a prayer over us and I'm gonna sing one more song to Jesus and I'm gonna come out and send you off with a blessing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path and we just wanna believe your words, Jesus. We wanna just do it. (laughs) So help us in your precious name. Thanks for watching. If this message helped you, share it with someone you know. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you live in the area, we invite you to join us for one of our worship experiences. Go to cantnazarene.com for times and more information. Hey, thanks for being a part of our virtual community.